morning from my side. Um, it's been a, a little while since I was here because I couldn't make it last month because I had connectional uh, workshops that I had to attend. There's always something on the go in this church of ours, eh? Um, but it's good to be able to be with you today, especially as today we celebrate women. Um, and, and I know that it might be a bit odd to have a man preaching on, on the Women's Day and in Women's Month. But I need to say that I think it's important that the voice of men is also heard in support of women. Um, and, and that we together need to be doing all that we can to ensure that women um, are able to do what God has called them to do. And so our call to worship is up on the overhead. Um, I invite you to respond with the words in bold as I lead us through the rest. And so we gather today knowing that there are people in our world who are surrounded by violence and conflict on every side. Our work of peace begins with prayer. We gather today knowing there are people in our community who feel lost, alone, abandoned and forgotten. Our work of love begins with prayer. We gather today knowing there are people in this place, this neighborhood, this world that we all share, who experience overwhelming grief, despair and sorrow. Our work of hope begins with prayer. We gather not to look away from the world, but to witness the needs of our neighbors through the lens of God's love. May we be a people who pray and out of our praying do the work of bringing peace, love and hope to all we encounter. Amen. Our first reading is taken from Exodus chapter 1 verse 8 to chapter 2 verse 10. Then a new king who knew nothing about Joseph came to power in Egypt. He said to his people, these Israelites are so numerous and strong that they are a threat to us. In case of war, they might join our enemies in order to fight against us and might escape from the country. We must find a way to keep them from becoming even more numerous. So the Egyptians put slave drivers over them to crush their spirits with hard labor. The Israelites built the cities of Pithom and Ramses to serve as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed the Israelites, the more they increased in number, and the further they spread through the land. The Egyptians came to fear the Israelites and made their lives miserable by forcing them into cruel slavery. They made them work on their building projects and in their fields, and they had no mercy on them. Then the king of Egypt spoke to Shipra and Pua, the two midwives who helped the Hebrew women. When you help the Hebrew women give birth, he said to them, kill the baby if it's a boy, but if it's a girl, let it live. But the midwives feared God, and so did not obey the king. Instead, they let the boys live. So the king sent for the midwives and asked them, Why are you doing this? Why are you letting the boys live? <clears throat> they answered, The Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They give birth easily and their babies are born before either of us can get there. Because the midwives feared God, he was, he was good to them and gave them families of their own. And the Israelites continued to increase and become strong. Finally, the king issued a command to all his people, take every newborn Hebrew boy and throw him into the Nile and let all the girls live. During this time, a man from the tribe of Levi married a woman of his own tribe, and she bore him a son. When she saw what a fine baby he was, she hid him for three months. But when she could not hide him any longer, she took a basket made of reeds and covered it with tar to make it watertight. She put the baby in it and then placed it in the tall grass at the edge of the river. The baby's sister stood some distance away to see what would happen to him. The king's daughter came down to the river to bathe while her, while her servants walked along the bank. Suddenly, she noticed the basket in the tall grass and sent a slave girl to get it. The princess opened it and saw a baby boy. 
He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked her, Shall I go and call a Hebrew woman to act as a wet nurse? Please do, she answered. So the girl went and bought the baby's own mother. The princess told the woman, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So she took the baby and nursed him. Later, when the child was old enough, she took him to the king's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. She said to herself, I pulled him out of the water, and so I name him Moses. And then we turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> As for us, we have this large crowd of witnesses around us. So then, let us rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way, and of the sin which holds on to us so tightly. And let us run with determination the race that lies before us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross. And he is now seated at the right hand of God the right-hand side of God's throne. Think of what he went through, how he put up with so much hatred from sinners. So, do not let yourselves become discouraged and give up. Thanks be to God for this word to us. Friends, this Women's Month, as we celebrate women who have led the way, we remember the phrase, you strike a woman, you strike a rock. And of course, that's why we celebrate a Woman's Day and Woman's Month. Today's reading from Exodus shows us just this truth. When you strike a woman, you strike a rock. It's the women who really shine in this story. And without them, there would be no Moses to lead the Hebrew people out of slavery um, to the promised land. There would be no liberation without these women. One commentator put it this way, they said, in this chain of resistance that is executed exclusively by women, both Israelite and Egyptian, the Pharaoh's plans are subverted and the Israelites survive. Of course, it begins with the midwives, Sifra and Pua, who refuse to carry out Pharaoh's unjust order to murder Hebrew boys. Of course, this is an act of willful rebellion. In fact, it's an act of civil disobedience. And these women, whose names you may have heard for the first time today, pave the way for all future acts of civil disobedience against unjust laws. And of course, we know in our own history of women who have led in terms of civil disobedience against unjust laws. And that's what we remember on Women's Day. But we recognize too that throughout the church's history, the Methodist Church of Southern Africa and the church in Southern Africa, there's a history of civil disobedience against unjust laws. And if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be where we are today. But maybe we need to remember that the struggle is not over yet. There are still unjust laws. There are still, there is still injustice and oppression. And we need to continue the struggle. Very often, God's kingdom, God's reign, will clash with the powers and principalities that we find ourselves caught in. We're told in that story from Exodus that we heard, that the midwives feared God and so did not obey the king. Feared God and so did not obey the king. 
Now that fear that is used there is, is often misunderstood. Um, it's, it's, a, it's sad that it's translated as, as fear. It really means, it's not about being scared, it's about honoring God. And we honor God first and foremost before we honor anything else. And when God's, God's righteousness comes into conflict with the world's injustice, we choose God. Again, a commentator put it like this. The Hebrew midwives are great examples of faithful loyalty to their true kingdom, God's kingdom. The kingdom and reign to which all kingdoms and reigns should be upheld. Sometimes we have to choose where our loyalties lie. And God is always on the side of the oppressed. We have to stand against all oppression and exploitation and injustice. We see this kind of civil disobedience as standing against the principalities and powers that surround us. When Moses' mother hides him in defiance of Pharaoh's command, and when she can't hide him any longer, she makes a plan, which Moses' sister helps to execute. Note that Pharaoh's daughter recognizes, we are told, that this is one of the Hebrew babies. And so even the Pharaoh's daughter defies her father's evil schemes and places Moses under her protection. Now, I, I love this part of the story because not only is Moses then returned to his mother because his sister comes up and says, oh, okay, shall I find a wet nurse for you? Oh, I just happen to know someone. And so Moses is returned to his mother. But not, not only is Moses returned to his mother, she's paid by Pharaoh <laughs> to raise the one who will stand against the Pharaoh ultimately and show God's power. It, it, it truly does take a village to raise a child. All those women work together with God to bring about salvation, liberation. Again, the commentator puts it like this. In the work of the midwives, Pharaoh's daughter and Moses' mother and sister, God's agency aligns and intertwines with human agency to accomplish salvation. I love that idea. God's agency aligning and intertwining with human agency to accompany salvation or liberation. Another commentator put it so beautifully. They said this. This pharaoh really had a way with women, didn't he? First, he's bamboozled by two midwives. Then he's defied by his own daughter. And to make him even more of a laughing stock, if that's possible, his daughter gets Moses' sister, who had been watching in the bulrushes all along, and had to be the best babysitter there ever was, to find a nursemaid for little baby Moses. Who does she just happen to choose but her own mother, whom Pharaoh's daughter then puts on Pharaoh's payroll just so she can nurse her own baby? So in the end, Pharaoh ends up protecting, raising, and educating the very Hebrew boy child who's going to make him sorry that he ever heard of the Hebrews. And all the time without a clue that he's actually doing it. I tell you, woman, if ever there was a story that belonged to you and not to men, this has got to be that story. 
The midwives, Shifra and Pua, defied Pharaoh because they feared God, the author says. And Pharaoh's daughter and her helpers did what they did because she took pity on the baby. That is how a nation was saved. That is how there came to be anything left of the Hebrews down in Egypt before there was ever a Moses to save them. Before what needed to happen, it was a group of ordinary women working behind the scenes who really made things possible. Before what needed to happen did, it was a group of women, ordinary women, working behind the scenes who really made things possible. We remember the woman who marched in 1956, who paved the way for liberation from oppression. May we continue to follow the example of these women. The woman in scripture, and that's not the end of the story. There's still many more to come. We're going to sing a song now about all the women in scripture who continue to pave the way. And then throughout all of history, who continue to pave the way. May we follow their example. And wherever human life is at risk or vulnerable, may we work with God to bring about healing and liberation, dignity and justice. Let's pray. When the risk and vulnerability for our brothers and sisters is very real, O God, and where life could be denied and the cause of justice fail, give us faith not to wait upon clear instructions, but to act upon deep imperatives that your will may be done and your rule begin. Amen.